God is great and greatly to be praised on this Sunday. We are excited for what God is about to do through the Word of God. He's already touched our heart through worship, and God's going to do great things as we move forward. Look, the message today is called Aggressive Grace. Man, who don't need aggressive grace in their life? And we're going to talk about it and how Jesus demonstrated it to us in a major way. But we want for you to stay until the end. If God has brought you this far in the message, we believe that he wants to touch your heart through the word of God. So stay with us until the end. Create a space to where you can hear him, to where you can focus in, where you can you can write down what you need to write down and, and recap what you need to recap. And so as you do this, look, we want you to save this message because you might miss something in the middle. You save this message and also right now share this message with somebody. God calls us to extend the gospel, to share the gospel, to push it forward. What easier way than it is to share? Tag somebody in the comments, send somebody a text message, throw some hearts on this thing right now. Whatever you can do to spread the message of Jesus Christ. God wants to speak to your heart. He wants to speak through your friend's heart. He wants to speak to your family's heart. Share the message. Allow God to speak the way he wants to. God's going to do great things today through this aggressive grace. God bless you. We're getting ready to go into the message. Bless the Lord. We're excited to go into the word of God together. We're looking at Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 34. Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 34. 33 reads, and it says this from the King James Version. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. I want to focus in and hone in on verse 34. The first part it says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You can pray with me under the topic today, aggressive grace aggressive grace. Father, we thank you and we bless your name for this word that you have allowed to be dropped in our spirit to be heard today. Thank you for interrupting our scroll. Thank you for interrupting our morning. Thank you for allowing this word to reach us wherever we are and whatever we may be doing. God, we thank you for this word. We thank you, God, that you're a faithful God. You're faithful in the ups. You're faithful in the downs. You're faithful when we know what you're doing. We're faithful when we can't see you. Lord, we are just thankful to be called yours. And so, Lord, we just ask that you speak to our heart today. Open our hearts up that this word will hit home. Allow it to change our perspective. Allow it to change our heart. Allow people to see a difference from what you are doing with us. Lord, we just ask that you sit down in this place. Sit down in our homes. Sit down in our car sit down in our life, that we will feel you, that we will know you, that you will impact, leave an imprint in our heart. So God, we thank you and we're ready to listen. We open up our spirit, we open up our heart to hear you today. We thank you and we bless your name. In Jesus' name, somebody drop an amen. Hallelujah, shout right where you are. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. We're excited for what God is doing, man. I believe that the kingdom of God is at a place being released in the earth, being revealed in the earth through believers that we're about to see the church in a way that we've never seen her before. That she's going to shine so bright in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the hatred, in the middle of the ignorance, in the middle of all the things that we've seen and witnessed in the middle of confusion in the middle of chaos that the church is going to shine bright. I believe that thing to my core. I believe that God is doing something special in the hearts of leaders. God is doing something special in the heart of believers. God is doing something special in the heart of children that the Bible talks about in the last days, he'll pour out of his spirit onto all flesh. And I believe that people are, are connecting with him in a way and, and behind closed doors. And it's about to spill out into the public and people are going to get healed, delivered, set free. We're going to see revival like nobody's business. And we're going to see people come to the knowledge of 
Christ and we're going to see the church thrive. Amen. It's happening already. You just can't see it in the public. It's happening in prayer rooms. It's happening in prayer closets. It's happening uh, in private spaces. It's happening in homes. It's happening on jobs. I, I just feel that thing already. This ain't even the message, but I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to do something powerful in your life. And I don't want you to downplay it because there's not an audience. He's doing something in your heart and you need to allow him to continue to work on you. Let him let him build you up. Let him teach you his word. Let him expose you. Let him just be be comfortable in his spirit, be comfortable in his flow. God is doing something in the life of the believer. And I believe that through this season, there was something that was birthing in the darkness. There was something that was birthing when you couldn't really understand. There was something birthing when you couldn't see it. And there was something happening in that moment. And it's still happening now. And it's going to come out and impact lives. Amen. And so, you know, we we're here at this text. We're here at this message called aggressive grace. You know, we see at this point where, you know, Christ is made his way to Calvary. You got to understand at this point, you know, there's crying there. There's weeping. There's there's this this overwhelming sense of of what's going to happen. There's, there's, there's sadness, there's pain. There's, they, I can only imagine what it smells like. I can only imagine what it feels like. I can only imagine what this moment means for so many different people as they approach the place of Calvary. As they approach this place where Jesus, who we believe is the Messiah, the believe that is the king, that we expected for him to set up his kingdom, is making his way to a prisoner's death. And we find him coming to this place. And this place is something that we know what happens when you get here. This is not uncommon for crucifixions to happen. It's not uncommon for to have multiple crucifixions happening at the same time. This is, this is the way that they execute people. So we already have seen people die in this place and they are now taking him to the place of what we believe or what history tells us is the place of no return. The place of the skull, Golgotha, which we call Calvary. It's gone to this place. And history tells us that certain things happen at the crucifixion. And we haven't seen people come back from the crucifixion. I can only imagine the disciples who have lost all hope at this time. I can only imagine what people are feeling right now and the people who just show up to cry in the audience and the people who are screaming, the, the people who are there just getting a fix off the fact of the pain that he's experienced and people who are just there to, to just mock him even more. And it's so much going on in this scene at this moment in time that it has to be mind boggling. Can you imagine where your mind could go? At that point in time, can you imagine where your mind could go as people talk about you? Can you imagine where your mind could go if people are just getting hype off your pain? Can you mind, imagine where your mind could go as people are screaming and yelling and crying and, and there's blood running down your face and, there, and, and, and there's nails in your wrist and there's nails in your feet. And, and, and one person that's getting crucified along with you is talking to you and the other person is talking to you and they're having a discussion about you while you're in the middle. And can you imagine what it it feels like to be in the middle of a situation where you're experiencing pain for yourself and trying to stay focused on what you're called to do. Jesus, man, there's none like him. He holds his focus. Verse 30, and verse 34 says, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I don't want to skip past any part of this. In verse 34, it starts off with then. Then. What is the then? Why is it then? As we look back at verse 33, it says, And when they were come to a place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then. Somebody say, get there. Then when they got to Calvary, then said Jesus, you must understand that this 
this aspect of Jesus' life is so powerful because it's not so much that he was crucified that is powerful because outside of crucifixion being in line with what God had called him to do, crucifixion has always just been crucifixion. But because crucifixion was in line with God ordered steps for Jesus and for him to be the savior of the world and God had orchestrated this path, he got to the place of obedience. He got to the place where he was prophesied to be at. And then he spoke from the place of obedience. He spoke from the place of authority. He spoke from the place of being in alignment what God had called him to do. He spoke from that place. And when he got to that place, he opened his mouth. I hope I can preach this how I feel it. And the fact that we have to get to a place where we speak from our obedience and our alignment with the word of God, rather than just speaking from just our past experience or speaking from our feelings or speaking from what we've been through or speaking from what we face, but we speak from the place of God's word in alignment to what he says. We say it like this sometimes. Hey, you going to get that car? Well, I ain't got to the place where my finances allow me to get that car. What you mean is I may want it, but my finances hadn't got to a place. Oh, well, you're going to do X, Y, Z. Well, I'm not in the place to do that at this time. Oh, how do you feel about that? Well, I'm not in a place to talk about that yet. And you're not talking about a physical place. You're talking about a state of mind, a place where you have found yourself, a place where you have steadied yourself to where you can speak from a place of knowledge. You can speak from a place of truth rather than a place of hurt that you can spin from a place of truth rather than a space that you have just created based off debt, that you can really realize that your life has lined up the way it's supposed to be to speak from a place of truth rather than just your feelings, because your feelings will jack you up if you don't understand how to be disciplined enough to speak from the place of truth rather than the place of your feelings. Somebody say amen. So you got to get to that place. Somebody say get there. You got to get to a place where you allow what God is doing on the inside of you to speak rather than what happening on the outside of you. You got to get to that place where you allow God to use you mightily in spite of what you're feeling on the outside. You got to get to that place where you have the discipline that you are able to define yourself based on what God has to say about you rather than what the world has to say about you. You got to get to that place. Jesus is at a place on this journey where the world is screaming, folks are crying, his body is talking to him, his neighbors talking to him, people down beneath him are talking to him, the enemy's talking to him. So much stuff is going on in his surroundings, but yet he stays focused. And he doesn't speak until he gets into that place where he won't allow his pain to talk, where he won't allow his neighbor to speak for him, where he won't allow what the people were crying as they were going down the road to speak for him. But he speaks from the place of obedience because this is a part of the call and the purpose for the reason that I came for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for this purpose. He didn't forget his purpose because of the noise. He didn't forget his purpose because of the crowd. He didn't forget his purpose because of the pain. He didn't forget his purpose because of what he was going through. He allowed himself to get to a place. Somebody say get there. He allowed himself to get to a place to where the word had become flesh so much that he understood what he was supposed to do. And he allowed that purpose to talk from the inside out and said, listen, no matter what you're saying, no matter what you're doing, I know what I was called to do. We got to get to a place where we don't care what others think. We got to get to a place where we got our finances the way that's need to be. We got to get to a place, even though when it's not what we expect, we still trust God. We got to get to a place that we're able to believe him for the miraculous, even when it don't look like it's going to happen, even when we don't feel it, even when we don't see it, that we can still believe him for what he says. Somebody say, amen. It's not just a physical place, but it's a place on the inside that you get to. And you understand that the situation that you find yourself in is just a situation, but you don't let the situation get in you. 
See, we must get to a place where we don't allow what we are in to get in us. I might be in a battle, but the battle's not in me. I might be in a situation, but the situation's not being me. I might be in pain, but the pain ain't in me. I have separated myself from what I'm going through and my identity from that. I'm not identifying by what I'm going through. I might find myself in it, but that's not my identity. Somebody say divine ID. Write that down. Divine ID. Verse 34 says like this. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't want you to skip past this. Then said Jesus, this is what Jesus said, Father. Although they had Jesus in the place of a criminal, he doesn't let them take his identity. He never identifies with being a criminal. Come on. Criminals get crucified here. And, and those who have done heinous crimes get crucified here. And, and, and those who, who don't have a, anybody else who can stand in, in the gap for them get crucified here. And Jesus says, even though I'm in this situation, even though hopeless people find themselves here, even though the downtrodden find themselves here, even though criminals find themselves here, I will not identify based on what my situation says. I still understand that I'm a king's kid. I still call him father. I still call him Abba. I still pray to my father because though I am in the world, I did not originate from this place. Therefore, the situation that I am is not in me. I will call my father because my identity is in my father and my father is not you. You can't take away my identity. I got a divine ID. I understand you try to put this label on me, but that label don't fit because I got an identity that you know not of and I'm going to call him father. As I find myself in the place of a criminal where a criminal would be, He's still my daddy. He's still my daddy. He's still, I wish somebody would say, he's still my daddy. No matter what happened, no matter where I find myself, no matter what I'm going through, he's still my daddy. He's still father. He's still Abba. The cross can't take him away from me. The debt can't take him away from me. The pain can't take him away from me. What you said about me can't take him away from me. He's still father. I wish somebody would feel it deep down that no matter what they going through, he's still your daddy. And the one thing about it is if he's still my daddy, then I'm still identified as his child. And if I'm identified as his child, I got a right to everything that he has. And he says, father. Woo. How many times have you allowed what you found yourself in to separate you from him, that you built your own wall and you stacked it up so that you could hide from him. You stacked it up because you felt like you didn't deserve to be connected anymore. You stacked it up so that he couldn't see your flaws and you stacked it up because you didn't want him to get close to you anymore because you felt like you were undeserving and you stacked it up and you tried to hide from the call and you put all these things up in the way. You put drinking in between y'all. You put smoking in between y'all. You put running women in between y'all. You put running men in between y'all. You put all these different things. You put busy schedules in between y'all. You ran from the church. You did all these things trying to separate separate yourself from him, but yet he's still your daddy. He still love you. He still wants you. He still called you. And he knocked down the wall to come after you. Somebody say aggressive grace. Oh, I feel this thing today, y'all. Divine ID. He's still your daddy. And it's so amazing to me that out of all the things that they call you, that God only called you the truth. They might have called you a borrower, but God calls you a lender. They may have called you the tail, but God called you the head. He says, I love you with the everlasting love. He'll never give up on you. That while you were yet in your sin, Christ died for you and extended his love. He called you blessed when you felt cursed. He said, I'm still married to you when you saw when you called yourself a backslider. He said, I still love you. I still want you. And the prodigal son, he met you on your way back. He still loves you. 
you left, but he ain't never throw away your stuff because he said, I still love you and I still got your space set up for you. Somebody said it like this, said, if they got cars in heaven, then I love such and such is on the, bump, on the bumper sticker. I love Patrick is on his bumper sticker. He got a magnet on his refrigerator with my face on it. Not based on what I do, but based on who he is, for he is faithful. Where somebody will understand the divine ID. They will understand that God is doing something amazing on the inside of them in spite of what they find with their eyes. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write down aggressive grace, aggressive grace. It says, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I need you to understand that Christ is in a moment right now where he is so focused on his purpose that pain can't stop him. He's so focused on his purpose that what he's going through cannot stop him. He is so focused on his purpose that what the naysayer says can't stop him. See, he never related to the fact that people didn't believe that he wasn't the son of God or people didn't believe that he was the Christ. He always knew who he was because he had his divine ID. But yet while he finds himself in the middle of pain, he pulls strength together. He pulls focus together so that he can remember what he's called to do. And he begins to speak out of his purpose and not out of his pain. When can we get to a place where we can speak out of our purpose and not out of our pain? I realize that I'm going through something, but my purpose is what's coming out my mouth, not my pain. I realize that I find myself in a situation, but my situation ain't coming out my mouth. My purpose is coming out out of my mouth and I'm allowing God to do something on the inside of me the same way Christ was as he finds himself in the middle of two criminals he never identifies there but he begins to speak out of his purpose understanding for God so loved the world that I'm here and he begins to speak and he says father forgive them for they know not what they do. I need you to understand what that word no is and that he, that word no right there actually means to see so, Father, forgive them because they can't see what they're doing. They see, but they don't see. They don't get it. Have you ever been in a place where you see something, but you don't get it? You've been in the room with somebody and you see them, but you don't get it. You don't get them. You really don't see them in their fullness. They saw that they were crucifying a man and they heard about him, but they don't see what they're doing. They don't realize what their hand is doing. They don't realize the effect of what they're doing. They don't realize. He says, Father, forgive them in their ignorance. Ooh, sometimes the hardest people to forgive are ignorant folk because the only way that you really can break through ignorance is people have to accept their ignorance to birth education. See, if you already if you already think that you know it, then it's hard to teach you. But when you accept your ignorance, then that's the platform to receive education. See, one of the things is being a piano teacher is that sometimes people come and they already have knowledge and they try to teach the teacher, but the teacher is there to teach you something and and because they don't realize that they are ignorant of some things, they are not able to accept the education that's being offered. Jesus says they don't see what's happening right here. They see me, but they don't see who I am. And some people have treated you the way they treated you because they see you, but they don't see who you are. They don't see the fullness of the gifting that's on your life. They don't see the fullness of the call that's on your life. They don't see. It. But God says like this, like Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they don't see what they're doing. They're cutting me off but they don't see that I'm the answer to their prayer. They, they treating me this way, but they don't see that I'm blessing their life. They treating me this way, but they don't see what you're doing on the inside of me. But guess what? There's grace. There's aggressive grace for their ignorance. And I'll stand in the gap for them, even though they don't understand. And even though they're afflicting pain willfully in my life, I will stand in the gap and I will pray, Father, forgive them because I understand they don't understand what they're doing. But when <laughs> they don't understand what they're doing. But when they do this right here, the world's going to be changed before. Father, forgive them for they're the reason that this gospel message is here. They're the reason that I'm standing in the gap for them. They're the reason that the blood is running down my face. They're the reason that we got to preach this gospel. They're the reason that I got to give what till it hurts. They're the reason that we got standing here today and God and Jesus begins to speak. It says, Father, forgive them because they can't see what's happening. They can't see what's going on. They don't really see. Let me tell you something. When you got people in your life, what you see is what you get. See, you don't get girlfriend out your life no more, out your wife no more, because you don't see 
her as girlfriend no more. And, and, and since you don't see her as girlfriend no more, you don't treat her as girlfriend no more. And, I, and, and what I mean is because you don't see her as girlfriend, you don't date her like you used to and you don't court her like you used to and you don't go over the top like you used to because all you see is mother. All you see is wife. But if you would see, oh my goodness, let's talk about it. See, some people got, got business geniuses in their life and, and they're your uncles and they're, and they're your aunts and they're your friends and all you can see them as is there is a friend. All you can see them as is a family member and that's all you get. What you see is what you get. But if you would ever allow the Holy Spirit to open your eyes so that you can see past what you've always seen and let revelation happen, then you could have what you see. See, Jesus said it like this one time. He says, who do men say that I am? And then he said, who do you see me as? And, and Peter stands up and says, thou art the Christ. And he says, because you can see me like that, then you can have something that other people haven't had. I wish you would understand that Christ wants you to open up his word. And I know you've read it since you were a child and I know you've seen it since you were in Sunday school. But he said, if you would pray to me and spend time with me, I would allow you to see something that you never seen. And when you can see it, there's something that will happen on the inside of you. And I believe that God is speaking to your heart today. They said, I need for you to, to see. But all those years that you haven't seen and you've been ignorant, God says, I have aggressive grace for you. Aggressive grace for you. Grace that will find you. Grace that will kick down walls to come to where you are. Grace that will come behind where you hid yourself. Grace that will find you tucked away under alcohol. Grace that will find you ignoring him. Grace that will find you running away from the church. Grace that will come to you and, and pick you up. And grace that will bring you back to him. Grace that will die on the cross for you while you were yet in your sin. Grace that will allow you to experience his goodness when you don't deserve it. Grace that will run you down and chase you. Grace that will grab you in a message coming through faith. Facebook and YouTube and will grab you right where you are and begin to deal with your heart. Grace that won't leave you alone. Aggressive grace. Grace that will come after you. Grace that will forgive the mistake even though you've made it over and over again. Grace that will say even though you're afflicting pain on me. Father, forgive them. Because at this time right now, they don't see it. They don't know what they're doing. They don't get it yet. They don't really understand. They don't see what's happening. And we've all had points in our life and we've all been through things where we didn't get it, where we didn't see, where we didn't know what we were doing. But God graced us anyway. Old school would say it like this. Lord, helpful. Lord, helpful. You be outside working on something and you. You think you know what you're doing and you really don't know what you're doing. And the old folks will come out and look at you and be like, huh? And you think you're doing it right. They look at it and say, Lord, help them. What they're saying is you don't even know that you're operating out of ignorance. And the only one that's going to be able to show you that you operate out of ignorance is you and the Lord on this journey. And hopefully you don't go too far and make too many mistakes before you realize that you were ignorant in the first place. But they sum it all up and say, Lord, help them. Because sometimes it takes the Lord stepping in. Sometimes it takes the Lord being there on the journey or the detours that you make along your life. Sometimes it takes the Lord being there when you don't have any other choice. Sometimes it takes the Lord being there after you to messed up time and time again. Sometimes it just takes the Lord being there and understanding the fact that after I done did all that I figured out I could do, that he is right there saying, if you would just turn to me, you could have everything that you need. Aggressive grace. Aggressive grace. Because sometimes you don't understand why people treat you the way they do. But is it possible that they don't see you the way God sees you? And that's not a license not to forgive them. For Jesus, who is on the cross, says, Father, forgive them. 
Father, this grace that I'm dying for, and they're the one killing me, extend it to them. <laughs> what kind of love is that? That while blood is running down his face, while he is experiencing pain, while he got nails in his wrist and nails in his feet and being mocked even in this moment while he's praying, saying, Father, forgive them. They're gambling for his clothes. And, and yet he is still saying, Father, forgive them. And we have trouble forgiving people because they ain't like our post on Facebook. We got trouble forgiving people because they gave us a side eye. We got trouble forgiving people for things that they did 20 years ago. We got trouble forgiving people. He says, where is that aggressive grace that I extended to you that ran you down and chased you? I love the song Reckless Love that came after you to grab you and pull you back up. Father, forgive them. A lot of the things that we deem as hatred is birthed out of ignorance. It is the lack of education. It is the lack of truth. It is the lack of God being evident in their life and in their spirit. And Jesus recognized that said, if they truly understood, if they truly could see, if they were exposed to this truth in a way that they could really grasp it, he says, listen, they, they are doing this because they can't see. They are doing this because they are ignorant. They are doing this because they don't know. Father, forgive them for they, they haven't got it yet. And, and through this season, the church is going to have to have some grace for the ignorant. The church is going to have to have some grace for the people who don't know. The church is going to have to have some perseverance for people who are trying to get it together. The church is going to have to extend the grace that Jesus extended to them as we go and gather what the enemy tried to steal and try to gather the souls that the enemy tried to keep captive. And as we gather and we capture back for the Lord what the enemy tried to steal, we're going to need some grace for the ignorance that we're going to find. But the fact of the matter is, if God had aggressive grace with us, then we should be able to give aggressive grace to our neighbor. And as he loved us, we are supposed to love them. And I believe that something powerful is happening in the kingdom of God where people are coming in and he is preparing the church now to authorize and be able to go with aggressive grace and says, listen, I know you don't understand it. I know you don't understand where the Bible says this in John 3, 16. And I know you may not know that Genesis is at the beginning. And I know that you may not know that Revelation is at the end. And I know you may not know our church cliches. And I know you may not dress right when you come to church. And I know that you may say the wrong thing sometimes. And, and some of those words, may come out your mouth that we don't necessarily use on a regular. However, a grace of grace has found me and aggressive grace is going to find you and we're going to stay with you and we're going to show you and we're going to walk this thing out together. And guess what? We understand that we don't have it all together either. And we're going to walk this thing out together in the word of God. And we're going to see God do great things through broken people. We're going to see God do great things through broken vessels. We're going to see God do great things through people who other folks threw away because of aggressive grace. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God wants to use you in a major way. And I believe that this message was sent your way for a reason. that we realize that God has done major things in our life. But we find ourselves building up walls around us as it comes to other people. And God says, I want you to kick down that wall and extend forgiveness. The aggressive grace that found you extend that grace to them. The forgiveness that found you, extend that forgiveness to them. The love that found you, extend that love to them. Until they treat you like they treated Jesus, there's no excuse. The 
people who are gambling for his clothes, people who are beating him, pierced him in his side. He says, Father, forgive them in their ignorance. They don't know. And the sad part is they don't know they don't know. But Lord, forgive them. Let me stand in the gap for them because they don't get it. And you might be the person today who don't get it, who didn't get it up until this point, who thought church was just about a game, who thought it was just about money, it was just a, a hoax, it was whatever. But today, something's happening on the inside of you and you're realizing that I was ignorant. I said it like this, I was blind, but now I see. I see that Jesus is real. I see that this word is resonating with me. I see that there's something powerful happening. I see it. I know this is a time where I'm supposed to get for real, for real, when it comes to the word of God and it comes to Jesus. That's you today. I want you to accept Jesus Christ into your heart. I want you to allow him to work on you. I want you to get to a place where you're able to walk this thing out with the body of believers. But all that's going to start today with saying this prayer and meaning it from your heart. And before we do that, there's some other folks on here that I believe are in a position where God wants you to forgive, to extend aggressive grace. Yeah, they talked about you. Yeah, they lied on you. Yeah, they turned their back on you. Yeah, you got, yes, it's not hearsay. He said, she said, you know. But as Christ looked down, saw them gambling for his clothes. And as Christ was beat, battered, and bruised, he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them in their ignorance. And the reason they treated you that way and the reason that they saw you like that because they didn't know. They were ignorant to what God was doing on the inside of you, who God had made you to be. Today, I want you to forgive them and let it go. And I believe a healing and deliverance is coming in a powerful way. If you want to accept Jesus, please pray with me. Say, dear Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And I accept you into my heart. I renounce Satan. I believe you rose on the third day and are still alive today. Make my salvation real to me and lead me by your Holy Spirit. Lord, those who are on here who need to forgive in a major way, God, I thank you that you're allowing their heart to open up, Father, that they'll be able to extend that aggressive grace, that no matter what they've been through, no matter what they face, God, that the overwhelming love that you have for us is pouring out into them even so much that they forgive themselves for the mistakes that they made in the past. So Lord, I thank you for this, this spirit of forgiveness rising up, this love, this power, this joy, this sound mind that is stirring in the hearts of your believers. So God, I thank you for that being a, a regular, a regular thing to where forgiveness and the kingdom of God is coming together even stronger. And Lord, I thank you for those who need healing and deliverance in their life now. I ask you, Father, just, just allow that to be evident in their life, that they will know that you are a healer. The destructive cycles that they've been on, that the exit sign will be illuminated and they'll be able to exit that destructive cycle, never to enter into it again in the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, and the church said, amen. Amen, amen. Put your hands together and give God a praise right there. I believe that God is doing something special in the life of the believer. And I believe that if you accept Jesus Christ into your heart today, that's the best decision that you could ever make. And God is doing something special in your heart. And we want you to connect with us so that you don't have to walk this thing out alone. Go ahead and text Rail Church to 54244. 
and you'll get an app sent back to you that has some things in it that will help you already along the way. And we want to connect with you and we want to, to touch base with you and we want to walk this thing out with you so you don't have to do it alone. We'd even love to see you in person sometimes. You can text me directly. That number's coming up on the screen. And we believe that God wants to do great things with you, that he allowed you to exist at this point in time for a reason. And that spirit, that power that you're feeling on the inside is him. He wants to do great things in your life and that you won't find yourself wasted, but you'll find yourself right in the middle of his purpose. Because his love is great for you, you'll be able to extend great love to someone else. So if you're watching and you want to give, you want to sow into the ministry, you're able to do that right there as those prompts come up on the screen. And so you can do it a couple of different ways. And we're able to go out and do the kingdom work. We're able to pour out into other people's lives. We're able to do what God has called us to do as you sow into the ministry. And so we're excited. We believe that God has called you here for a reason and that you are a part of the great things that God is doing in the earth. We are centered on God, declaring his truth and living in faith. He is relevant. You are relevant. We are relevant. And we believe that God is building his kingdom as we come together and serve him. God bless you.